And if you were with us uh, yesterday, we spoke with our meteorologist, Mike Kaplan, right off the top of our uh, Chicago Live hours here about warming water and the effects of that as we go through our fall into our winter season. But um, he was talking about the five Great Lakes. We want to widen things out now and, and speak about warming oceans. And I want to bring in uh, an expert in this particular topic who actually just got back from Florida doing some diving there. Uh, Dr. Trinity Kahn, um, she is a postdoctoral research fellow at Shedd Aquarium. Thank you for your time. Hi, thank you, happy to be here. So I uh, understand you, you just got back from this trip. Um, tell me about your experiences there monitoring coral bleaching um, that we were just kind of mentioning um, happens from this, this warm water that we're experiencing. Yeah, so uh, right now we're sort of at the end of the peak thermal thermal stress that these corals will experience in in Florida, sort of the end of the end of the Florida summer, um, and over the last couple of years, corals, particularly in Florida and the Caribbean, have experienced um, some of the biggest, uh, longest heat waves that they've ever seen. And so, over the past couple of years, we've uh, seen a lot of coral bleaching, which is where the corals lose their uh, partner algae that helps give them all their energy, um, and they turn white. And then that often leads to mortality. So when I was just down in Florida, um, we actually did see a significant amount of bleaching, not as much as as we would have expected, which is a really great a great sign. But uh, across the entire Florida Keys, we saw bleaching of lots of different species of coral, um, as well as even in some deeper sites where you would expect it to be a little cooler, maybe a little bit of a, a refuge from that that rising ocean temperature. Uh, we did see bleaching there as well. So let me ask you this. Um, there are some reports that this is like we're at, we're at a tipping point. Would you describe where we are as that? I do think so. I think that reefs have been very resilient over the last few decades of rising temperatures um, and rising carbon emissions. However, we're seeing because of some really intense heat waves, as I described over the last couple of years, we're seeing some species that are the major reef builders, some of the most important species for making coral reefs what we what we expect and what we want them to look like. Uh, we're seeing almost mass mortality of those species across, for example, Florida, the entire Florida reef tract, um, and across the Caribbean and the greater Pacific as well. So I do think that we're at what what I would consider a tipping point in when the function of these ecosystems. And can for those who may not understand, um, you know, if you're sitting at home on dry land uh, and you don't really understand what is the significance of what we're seeing there, uh, you know, beneath the water, uh, explain that for us. So coral reefs are one of the most important ecosystems in the entire world. They you know, are sometimes called the rainforest of the sea, people may have heard. Uh, they only cover about 1% of the ocean floor, but support over 25% of marine biodiversity. So even here in Chicago, we're far away from, you know, the tropical ocean or any ocean at all, but we're still seeing the benefits of coral reefs. They support ecosystems um, and protect coastal economies, as well as support these coastal economies. And without, as these corals die and we lose that support from those animals, we lose the fish in those ecosystems that people rely on for food and for their livelihoods. We lose the structure of those reefs, the sort of beautiful reefs that you know you can see from space. We lose that structure as well. Uh, and we experience, we lose a lot of the benefits that those coral reefs actually give to us in addition to losing the beautiful biodiversity that's that's there. So where did, if you don't mind me asking, where exactly did you have to go uh, to do this type of study? Like where is the coral reef that you oh, were studying? So Florida actually has the third largest barrier reef in the entire world, um, which is a beautiful reef all across from um, just north of Miami to down through the Keys um, and then out to what's called the Dry Tortugas National Park, which is just um, a little bit past Key West. And so uh, Shed actually has a research vessel that is docked in Miami. And so we can take that boat all the way down through the Florida Keys and stop and monitor the reefs the whole way down. Hmm. Very interesting stuff. And how long were you there? We were there for two weeks. 
Hmm, wow. Okay, and then you take that research and, and what do you do next with it? So SHED is involved in coral research in lots of different ways. So one aspect is what we were doing on that cruise, which is trying to understand what's still there and manage and protect the species that are still there. So taking those surveys, analyzing, okay, which species are are more um, resilient, potential, potentially under thermal stress or less resilient. Um, and then we use that also to inform some emerging science that can maybe be used as an intervention for to protect these corals. Um, so we're looking at how we can improve uh, these corals resilience at the larval stage uh, uh, and then as well understanding maybe how their DNA is contributing to whether or not they're resilient to thermal res uh, uh, stress events or more sensitive. Uh, and then we can use that to try and improve conservation and restoration efforts. Let me drill down a little bit further into um, your comment about intervention. Can you talk about um, artificial reefs and whether they show signs of promise? Yeah, so artificial reefs are uh, a really interesting idea that shows some benefits. So they, they bring some of the benefit of a reef, which is the home for a lot of fish. Um, but unfortunately, artificial reefs can never replace a natural reef uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they can't continue to grow. So coral reefs are like a, a constantly renewing artificial reef. They can keep growing, keep building. Um, and these artificial reefs can't do that. So they'll, they'll eventually erode and you lose that structure. As well, the species diversity of a coral reef is really what brings um, a lot of those other uh, species around, like fish, megafauna, like sharks. You need the corals themselves to bring those animals there. There's actually some work that shows that fish are attracted to the sounds of a healthy reef. That hmm. is, that's something that the artificial reef can't really replicate. Wow. So is there, I mean, we're talking about like devastating consequences if we lose them, but is there a way of turning things around before you get to the permanent damage? I think there's always a way of turning things around. I think we have, we have definitely approached some uh, goalposts of long-term damage uh, that we won't be able to sort of undo. Um, for example, losing some really important species, losing some structure. However, there's never a too late, um, particularly when you're looking at protecting these ecosystems. There are always species that are contributing to a healthy reef that we can help manage, help protect, um, and ev also every effort towards lowering our carbon emissions and lowering the rate of rising temperatures will help these reefs sort of get a little bit of a leg up in that in that race. So then what are the warnings you would give to those of us who are just out and about? Well, what, what are the warnings to the greater public? I think the warnings to the greater public is that carbon emissions are should be our number one priority um, in the sort of fight for ecosystem resilience and biodiversity loss. Um, carbon emissions are people can focus on lowering their personal carbon emissions. Uh, companies need to be able to implement new policies that reduce their own carbon emissions. And our leaders need to be implementing policies that, you know, control our carbon emissions and really lower that, that temperature rise that we're sort of approaching really rapidly. And so I think that's, that's something that everyone should have on their minds is that every little bit counts towards lowering uh, rising uh, global temperatures. Yeah, at the shed, what do you all do to educate people on those things? So we actually have a lot of exhibits on right now um, in our coral reef exhibit, in our wild reef uh, habitats, um, talking a little bit about our work, looking at thermal resilience, how we can identify individuals that are more thermally resilient and implement them in restoration practices. And so we can you know, try and build a more resilient reef so the lot that people can read about that, we have as well um, our guest relations people out there with a little corals that can change color and the temperature to really educate people about what is actually happening in these reefs. Because I know it's really hard to understand when you're not underwater with these animals and seeing it happening in real life. Yeah, are there anything from from you all's um, you know environmental perspective where you see us doing things right or headed in the right direction? I think there there is. I think that we've seen, I mean, I think we've seen a slowing of predicted global global warming over the, because of 
you know, different uh, global actions. And even the last couple of years, despite 2023 was a, a pretty uh, historic heat wave in, in the Caribbean and Florida, in the last couple of years, even with continuing temperatures, we're not seeing as severe bleaching as we have in the past, which means that there does seem to be sort of a, a glimmer of hope there and that continued work towards supporting the scientists and practitioners that are on the ground and doing your own work to support reducing, reducing carbon emissions is, I think, the right direction. Well, I think we can end on a note of hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for, um, one, what you do and making some time for me today. Thank you so much for having me.